I'm Jason Kelly here with a couple very special guests, very timely guests. As we think about the year ahead, top of mind for sure is climate. I'm joined by Jim Coulter and Hank Paulson, two very well-known names in the world of investing, in government, in global politics, in all of it. Uh, Jim, I'm going to start with you because you and I have done this for a few years. This is fun to uh, to do again with you. We think about the year ahead. We hear what you're saying to your investors. This year, we thought we'd do something a little bit different, and we talked about focusing in on one issue. We talked about you bringing a friend, and uh, man, you delivered. Well done. Gold <laughs> star. Tell me what's going on here. Good. In the past, Jason, when we've talked, we've brought you a whole set of themes that were entry interesting us. And right now, we really want to focus down on probably the biggest thing I see happening in the markets, the biggest thing for what may be the next 20 years of investing, and that is the total rewiring of the economy for a non-carbon environment. Now, we've been talking about this for a while. We've been talking about the why of impact investing for a while. What we haven't talked about is the when and the how. So I think we're here today to focus on the when and the how. Let me begin with the when. The when is now. And what happened, Jason, is bottoms up a few years ago, we started to see a change in our deal flow for climate investing. And four forces really came together, four forces that had been lurking but hadn't quite reached their full power. The first is the net zero pledges. We have 30 trillion, let me just repeat that number, 30 trillion of government net zero pledges. We have 1,500 companies that have made net zero pledges. And yet none of them can say how that's going to happen. The second thing that happened is consumers now get it. It's kind of the Greta phenomena. 55% uh, of the growth in CPG products have been in sustainable products. People are willing to put their pocketbook where their beliefs are. Third thing that happened is investors started to pay attention. Everyone from Larry Fink to the Canadian pension funds have said this is at the top of their list for how they are going to think about the responsibility of companies. The fourth thing, and this is the thing that I saw and got me truly excited, is the technology change. 90% down in a decade in solar costs, 60% down in onshore wind, 70 plus percent down in battery costs. Suddenly things that used to require subsidies can just be done on pure capitalism. And so it's time for pure capitalism to step up and uh, this is the big theme, not only today, but I would argue for the decade ahead. And thus, TPG Rise Climate is born, and you are the, the managing partner, and the executive chairman, Hank Paulson, is, is joining you in this. So, Hank, how do you get involved in something like this? It is a big deal for you to, to make this sort of move, given your experience and given all the ambitions that you have around these issues. Yeah, a, a, a good question, because I care deeply about the issue. And so when I left Treasury, I worked very hard on climate and environmental issues, but I did it through various uh, uh, NGOs that that I chaired or co-chaired and set up, you know, and you know, focused on U.S. China and with, with the Paulson Institute and Economic Strategy Group, but a number of these, and because I just see climate as the most uh, certain, uh, formidable risk that uh, we're, we're going to face, and so I was uh, I, I was approached by uh, TPG. I've Long had a high admiration for, for Jim and his co-CEO there, John Winkle-Reed, worked with me for years at Goldman Sachs. And, uh, you know, as I talked with them about, about this opportunity, it was just clear to me that it is a huge opportunity. And I thought, you know, I could combine my policy work by doing it with a big pool of capital and, and make a difference. Because the thing that is just so obvious to me is that as we rewire society, it's going to take a huge amount of capital. And that capital isn't going to be there if it's just for a concessionary return. It, it's going to take, you know, full returns to attract the private capital necessary. And, you know, there's a great opportunity right now, because right now, for the reasons that Jim mentioned, you know, there's, there is... 
a huge opportunity. And there's a hole in the market because when, when you look at the market, you, you look at all the public sentiment, the public look at the public money, you know, pouring into Tesla. And you've got venture capital and you've got contracted renewables, but there's this big opportunity that hasn't been filled to, to, to really build outstanding private companies that make a difference in climate change. So to me, that was that was an opportunity. The other thing I would add to what Jim said about what helps bring this all about is the public. You know, he mentioned the public. And why is the public so focused today? You look at these climate shocks and disasters all over the United States, you know, the, the, the wildfires, the droughts, you know, all, the heat waves in Asia and Africa. And people are alarmed and people want to see action. And that helps drive business to action and it helps drive governments to act. And so, Jim, let's talk about that middle, because that seems to be the key here. Give me some examples of what that looks like and what it looks like at scale. Right. So um, the question is, uh, how do you take the very good work that has been done in the venture world and bring it to scale? And we're used to the digital world, Jason, where that happens pretty easily. Just put it out on the Internet, it goes. One of the real challenges of the climate world is going to be this takes physical scaling. So this is an area we at TPG know well. We were early investors in Airbnb and Uber as they came out of the venture world and until they scaled and before they hit the public market. And that's the area that is probably less developed today than it needs to be for the amount of capital that is required. So let me give you an example of some of the things uh, we're doing. We just announced a uh, investment in a company called Element, which essentially is one of the largest producers of carbon credits doing renewable natural gas. The whole carbon credit market is going to be one of the most fascinating markets of the next decade. It's going to be Bitcoin with substance because we're going to have to speak in these credits almost as a new sort of currency for the non-carbon economy. We recently announced a SPAC deal around a company called EV Box, uh, you know, 190,000 charging ports across Europe. Think of it as Peloton. It's not just the hardware, it's the software that ties those together in a way that, that saves energy costs. We're doing a gig of development of solar across Peru, the U.S., and, and uh, uh, the, uh, in Europe. We are the largest producer of rooftop solar in, uh, in India. Uh, so if you begin to get into this, you realize that climate is not one thing. It's across vehicles. It's across greening industrials. We built a brand-new steel plant that is 90 percent more efficient. So 30 years ago, if you were an investor, Jason, you would have said, you know, maybe this, maybe this digital thing is a big thing. I might want some specialized capital against this digital revolution. And you probably would have underestimated just how big it was. The next 30 years, I believe that the climate revolution will very much mimic what happened in the digital world. We're going to have new business models. You know, Hank and I were laughing the other day. In some ways, Tesla may be AOL. Not how it ends, but this is the first of, of many new models in many new areas. You know, we haven't yet created the Google. We haven't created the Facebook of the climate revolution. Those things should be created between venture capital and the public markets. One of the risks right now is that they're getting to the public market too soon because the private market isn't as developed as it should be. And so, Hank, talk to me about the public side of this. We're, we're talking about a week after the United States went back into the Paris Agreement. China, obviously, is a huge piece of this. Tell me how governments, especially governments in 2021, a new administration here in the United States, how does that play into this opportunity and how do you leverage that? Well, first of all, it's huge because uh, Joe Biden ran with climate change being an important part of his agenda. And climate diplomacy is going to be an important part of his agenda. And uh, the things we're going to see done in the United States that, uh, are, are going to make a big difference, but around the world. So he has a historic opportunity and a historic need to restore global cooperation. But I will say that Paris, as important as it is and as essential as it is, it is not sufficient because Paris 
governors, governments make these pledges, these net zero pledges, and the only thing they're obligated to do is to report regularly on whether they're going to meet them. And these, these are going to be terribly difficult to meet. Right now, we're not on track to meet the pledges, and even if we met them, the world would overheat. So that's why it is so important to have uh, to have climate finance be developed and continue to be developed and make the advances. And so, you know, and I can think of, you can think of all kinds of examples. If, if you look at China, that is by far the biggest carbon emitter. And they've pledged, you know, they're going to peak their carbon at 2030, carbon neutral at, at, at 2060. That's very ambitious. And so just Understand, you know, Jim talks about rewiring an economy. Just think what it what that means for China when you've got these, you know, the largest manufacturer in the world, they'll be the largest economy in the world, and you got all this heavy industry, you know, the petrochemicals, the, all the heavy manufacturing in steel and cement, and you know, and, and how you redo that, it, it's going to take massive amounts of investment, trillions and trillions. And out of that investment is going to be some tremendous opportunities to make very big profits, which then will be necessary to attract more and more capital. And so, Jim, this from a competitive is. landscape perspective, you know, how do you tackle that from, from the finance and investing perspective? You helped, you know, birth the modern private equity uh, industry. You saw that get more and more competitive. Right now, candidly, this doesn't look that competitive. There aren't that many funds out there doing it. How does that evolve in the short term from your estimation? Well, there, there aren't a lot of specialized funds doing it. People are touching on it, but just like you want specialized capital for the digital revolution, we need to build specialized capital here because once you get specialized capital, you get a flywheel of knowledge and opportunity. So um, I... Let me touch on why we're treating this as a problem to be solved as much as an opportunity. It's clear that the finance markets have to reflect this need for the capital. And the other side of that coin will be an amazing opportunity. And if we're successful, we'll, we'll funnel more capital. So Hank and I view this as an opportunity to generate extraordinary returns, but also as a mission to generate those returns to bring more capital. And that, that flywheel is what needs to get going. So we started this effort really over a year ago to look at how would this problem get solved. And we realized that we needed a few things that you wouldn't normally need in private equity. First of all, so much of it is going to happen at the intersection of business and policy. So having Hank join us is, a, I think, a very important move. Uh, last time the world had a crisis of business and policy and government coming together, Hank was there and helped us through. This is another crisis, and we're really pleased to have him focus. All of us ought to be pleased to have them focus on, on this intersection. The second thing, though, is you can't just do a startup here. This needs to happen now. So we started building a portfolio several years ago to prove to ourselves that it was happening and that we could scale it. So we're now taking that portfolio and raising specialized capital around it because you need to move quickly here. Which brings me to the last point. We're doing this, building it on the chassis of TPG. So again, we want to live between the great work that's been done in venture capital, the great work that's going on, on the policy side. But our job is to take these ideas, get capital to them, scale, and build returns that will get the flywheel going. So it's, uh, it's both sides of the coin. There's a need and there's an opportunity. We're connecting them. So, uh, Hank, Jim took me right where I was going to go, which is this notion of managing through a crisis. You arguably manage through one of the greatest crises of our time, if not the greatest crisis of the time, the global financial crisis. How do you use that playbook uh, to deal with something that is also literally existential here? What sort of experience do you draw on? What are the lessons from that that can be applied here? Well, I tell you, this is more difficult and more insidious because crisis management is easier when it's immediate, right? And it's easier when it's domestic as opposed to global. And this is global, and it's in its longer term. And so th those are two things that, that make this difficult. But uh, I, I think that we have, so, so in many ways, it, it is, it, this is different. But 
I, I tell you, the crisis is one that people are seeing, you know, every day around the world in terms of these climate, uh, these, these climate shocks. And so I think that that there are certain similarities. Like, for instance, it takes the public sector, uh, it takes governments working with markets, okay? And, and so I think that's going to be a big part of this. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I, I do think there is a, there, there's a sense of urgency and people are going to increasingly see that urgency. And the, and, and so to me, I'd say those are the, the, the biggest similarities but I would say one thing as I look at it that I think is going to be very difficult to do and it's going to be important. And that is, I think we need to take Paris to the next step. And that's going to be largely governments because we're going to need something that's focused on the big economies, not every economy, the big economies. And it's going to have to deal in a very straightforward way about, the, about free riding. And and it's you know, we're going to need things that 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 have real teeth in them, and uh, and you know it d discourage free riding. So I think we're going to need new mechanisms to bring to bring uh, major economies together. And I think that was the frustration that I dealt with in the financial crisis, because it took Congress. Being able to see, to see the crisis spreading from banks to Main Street to get Congress to act, and so what it's going to take here, which is going to be more difficult, it's, it's going to take uh, the world seeing this accelerate to, to really and to have the publics in each one of these countries push their nations to to, to do something that that has got teeth in it. But here, I would tell you, I think what we are doing right now has got the potential to make a real difference. Because I think as you see progress being made, you know, you got to see progress, progress on the ground and investments being made that make a difference. And the thing that Jim didn't mention yet about the TPG, uh, uh, rise climate fund is the Y analytics because we, that was very important to me that we're not just going to get a big return in terms of in, in terms of profit on capital but we're going to get a big return in terms of climate emissions avoided carbon emissions avoided and there are some really cool me mechanisms that TPG has developed to measure that. And I think when you can measure that and show that and show progress, it's easier to get governments to act. And I think if you could come to governments with a big pool of capital, it's easier to get them to act. And so, Jim, to that point about pool, pooling capital, how would you describe the sense of urgency or maybe more pointedly, the sense of appetite on the part of institutional investors to invest behind this? Is there a comparison that, that you would make here? Um, I think the awareness in the institutional investment market is very high. What they're lacking is the solution for how to approach the market. If you look, Jason, into the public market, ESG ETFs, which are largely driven by the E, have been one of the most attractive performing and hottest parts of the sector because people are trying to express this idea. And what I think needs to happen is all parts of the financial world, from green bonds through ETFs, through sector funds like we're talking about through the venture capital world, all of these need to be uh, enabled and enacted in order to meet this challenge. And it needs to happen relatively quickly. We have to prove the returns. The returns will only be proved in the rearview mirror, as Hank likes to say. But we want to make sure that we, we make it clear that this will be focused on the market joining with government to help this to happen. And for me, the ability to bring those two together is, is the two sides of that coin. And, so, and Hank, when, do when it, I – go ahead, Hank. I was going to say, and to do it the way TPG 
is looking to do it globally. So there can be learning, you know, climate solutions that work in one nation can be used in another. And so the, the, the investors in this fund, one of the things we love about it is the investors, we'll have smart investors that will help give us ideas and we will get, uh, and, and they will have a window on what's happening around the world. And that, that will accelerate the progress. So, Hank, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about a, a potential player in all of this, which is the newly confirmed person who is sitting in your old seat, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. I would imagine this is on her to-do list. What role does the Treasury Secretary play here in the United States? What advice would you give uh, Secretary Yellen here? Well, first of all, we are all really fortunate to have her, someone with her experience, and she's close to the president, and she's got all the interpersonal skills, to, and she was con confirmed with a great uh, bipartisan by, you know, uh, support in Congress. So I think she has got a very difficult job, and but she's very well equipped to do it. And she understands climate change, cold She's been looking at it for a long time, and finance has a big role to play, and so she will have a big role to play. And, you know, it is a, at its heart, climate change is an economic issue. That's, that's really what it is. And so it's something that falls squarely in, on the Secretary of the Treasury's plate. And so globally, you know, as the Biden administration works on it, she'll have a big role to play. And of course, here in the U.S., you know, once we get, we got to get through the night first. And, you know, so her, her biggest problem is right, the U.S. economy, you know, fixing the U.S. economy, which will be relief and stimulus on the front end. But then the recovery, a big part of the recovery is going to be investing in you know, in our long-term competitiveness and uh, preserving our economic security and climate and green investing will be part of it. And, and so, again, uh, we're fortunate to have her and uh, she's got a huge job in front of her, a very difficult job, but boy, we, we could be all grateful she's agreed to take it on. And I, I know for sure that climate change is going to be an important part of her agenda. So, Jim, as we begin to wrap this up, I, I do have to ask you, you know, you are in the business of risk and opportunity. What's the downside here? Like, what do you worry about as you get this thing launched and, and all put together, you continue to do deals? What do you worry about the most? I think the biggest risk is, of course, inaction, because um, I think uh, um, there was a risk for a long time, and I think this bit a lot of investors of being too early. But what I'm here, I think, and what we're telling you is that we're seeing bottoms up that it's happening now. So um, the risk is for investors everywhere not to express this in your portfolio. It will be volatile. There's a chance that some of the runs that you see in the market will echo what you saw in the digital period, where occasionally the market will get ahead of itself. But the long-term trend that gave us Apple, Google, Facebook, Instagram, um, Salesforce, that trend is going to play out, and it's all in front of us. So the risk is for investors not to have an opinion on how they're going to participate. And the risk for our country is to fail to participate. To your point, um, Hank, Department of Energy tells us that renewable energy has five times the job creation of fossil fuel. So we need to do this not only from an energy point of view and a climate point of view, we need to do this from an economic point of view. So there's a, there's a risk of being early. I think we may be past that risk. There will be a risk of volatility, but we have greatly reduced the risk of this isn't happening. It's happening and it's happening now. And another way of looking at that is the risk to our planet. And when you look, which is incredible, and the risk to the planet is so great, you know that the investment has got to come. For that, so that's just a certainty. Otherwise, we're going to self-destruct. 